Story One of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story One They Saw a Great Light. Chapter Two Trips Cove. Part One. Call this a long preface, if you please, but it seems to me best to tell this story so that I may explain what manner of people those were and are who lived, live, and will live at Tripp's Cove, and why they have been, are, and will be linked together with a sort of family tie and relationship which one does not often see in the villages self-formed or formed at haphazard on the seaside, on the hillside, or in the prairies of America. Tripp's Cove never became the great mercantile city of the future, nor do I believe it ever will. But there Samuel Cutts lived in a happy life for fifty years, and there he died, honored, blessed, and loved. By and by there came the second war with England. The Endymion came cruising along upon the coast, and picking up the fishing boats and the coasters, burning the ships on the stocks, or compelling the owners to ransom them. Old General Cutts was seventy years old then, but he was, as he had always been, the head of the settlement at Tripp's, and there was no lack of men younger than he, the sergeants or the high privates of the fighting twenty-seventh, who drilled the boys of the village for whatever service might impend. When the boys went down to Runkin's and sent the Endymion's boats back to her with half their crews dead or dying, faster than they came, old General Cutts was with them, and took sight on his rifle as quickly and as bravely as the best of them. And so twenty years more passed on, and when he was well nigh ninety, the dear old man died, full of years and full of blessings, all because he had launched out for himself, left the life he was not fit for, and undertaken life in which he was at home. Yes, and because of this also, when 1861 came, with its terrible alarm to the whole country and its call to duty, all Tripp's Cove was all right. The girls were eager for service, and the boys were eager for service. The girls stood by the boys, and the boys stood by the girls. The husbands stood by the wives, and the wives stood by the husbands. I do not mean that there was not many another community in which everybody was steadfast and true, but I do mean that here was one great family, although the census rated it as five and twenty families which had one heart and one soul in the contest, and which went into it with one heart and one soul, every man and every woman of them all bearing each other's burdens. Little Sim Cutts, who broke the silence that night when the postman threw down the Boston Gazette, was an old man of eighty-five when they all got the news of the shots at Fort Sumter. The old man was as hale and hearty as are half the men of sixty in this land to-day, with all his heart he encouraged the boys who volunteered in answer to the first call for regiments from Maine. Then, with full reliance on the traditions of the Fighting 27th, he explained to the fishermen and the coasters that Uncle Abraham would need them for his web-footed service as well as for his legions on the land, and they found their ways to Portsmouth and to Charleston, so that they might enter the Navy as their brothers entered the Army. And so it was that when Christmas came in 1861, there was at Tripp's Cove only one of that noble set of young fellows who but a year before was hauling hemlock and spruce and fir and pine at Christmas at the girl's order, and worked in the meeting-house for two days as the girls bade them work, so that when Parson Spaulding came in to preach his Christmas sermon, he thought the house was a bit of the woods themselves. Only one. And who was he? How did he dare to stay among all those girls who were crying out their eyes and sewing their fingers to the bones, meeting every afternoon in one sitting-room or another, and devouring every word that came from the army? They read the worst-spelled letter that came home from Mike Sowen, 
and prized it and blessed it and cried over it as heartily as the noblest description of battle that came from the pen of Carleton or of Swinton. Who was he? Ah, I have caught you, have I? That was Tom Cutts, the old general's great-grandson, Sim Cutts' grandson, the very noblest and bravest of them all. He got off first of all. He had the luck to be at Bull Run, and to be cut off from his regiment. He had the luck to hide under a corn-crib, and to come into Washington Hole a week after the regiment. He was the first man in Maine, they said, to enlist for the three years' service. Perhaps the same thing is said of many others. He had come home and raised a new company, and he was making them fast into good soldiers out beyond Fairfax Courthouse, so that the brigadier would do anything Tom Cutts wanted. And when, on the first day of December, there came up to the major general in command a request for leave of absence from Tom Cutts, respectfully referred to Colonel This, who had respectfully referred it to General That, who had respectfully referred it to Adjutant General Tother, all these dignitaries had respectfully recommended that the request be granted. For even in the sacred purlieu of the top Major General's headquarters, it was understood that Cutts was going home for no less a purpose than the being married to the prettiest and sweetest and best girl in eastern Maine. Well, for my part, I do not think that the aides and their informants were in the wrong about this. Surely that Christmas Eve, as Laura Marvel stood up with Tom Cutts in front of Parson Spaulding, in presence of what there was left of the Tripp's Cove community, I would have said that Laura was the loveliest bride I ever saw. She is tall. She is graceful. She has rather a startled look when you speak to her, suddenly or gently, but the startled look just bewitches you. Black hair, she got that from the Italian blood in her grandmother's family, exquisite blue eyes, that is a charming combination with black hair, perfect teeth, and matchless color. And she had it all when she was married. She was a blushing bride and not a fainting one. But then what stuff this is! Nobody knew he cared a straw for Laura's hair or her cheek. It was that she looked just lovely, and that she was just lovely. So self-forgetful in all her ways, after that first start, so eager to know just where she could help, and so determined to help just there. Why, she led all the girls in the village when she was only fourteen because they loved her so. She was the one who made the rafts when there was a freshet, and took them all out together on the mill-pond. And when the war came, she was, of course, captain of the girl sewing. She packed the cans of pickles and fruit for the sanitary. She corresponded with the state adjutant. Heavens! From morning to night everybody in the village ran to Laura, not because she was the prettiest creature you ever looked upon, but because she was the kindest, truest, most loyal and most helpful creature that ever lived, be the same man or woman. Now, had you rather be named Laura Cutts or Laura Marvel? Marvel is a good name, a weird, miraculous sort of name. Cutts is not much of a name, but Laura had made up her mind to be Laura Cutts after Tom had asked her about it, and here they are standing before dear old Parson Spaulding to receive his exhortation, and to be made one before God and man. Dear Laura! How she had laughed with the other girls, all in a good-natured way, at the good parson's exhortation to the young couples. Laura had heard it twenty times, for she had stood up with twenty of the girls, who had dared the enterprise of life before her. Nay, Laura could repeat, with all the emphasis, the most pathetic passage of the whole. And above all, my beloved young friends, first of all, and last of all, let me beseech you, as you climb the hill of life together, hand in hand, and step with step, that you will look upon the crests upon its summit to the eternal lights which blaze in the infinite heaven of the better land beyond. 
Twenty times had Laura heard this passage; nay, ten times, I am afraid, had she, in an honest and friendly way, repeated it, under strict vows of secrecy, to the edification of circles of screaming girls. But now the dear child looked truly and loyally into the old man's face, as he went on from word to word, and only thought of him, and of how noble and true he was, and of the great master whom he represented there. And it was just as real to her and to Tom Cutts that they must look into the heaven of heavens for life and strength, as Parson Spaulding wanted it to be. When he prayed with all his heart, she prayed. What he hoped, she hoped. What he promised for her, she promised to her Father in heaven and what he asked her to promise by word aloud, she promised loyally and eternally. And Tom Cutts? He looked so handsome in his uniform, and he looked like the man he was. And in those days, the uniform, if it were only a flannel fatigue jacket on a private's back, was as beautiful as the flag. Nothing more beautiful than either for eyes to look upon. And when Parson Spaulding had said the benediction and the amen, and when he had kissed Laura with her eyes full of tears, and when he had given Tom Cutts joy, then all the people came up in a double line, and they all kissed Laura, and they shook hands with Tom as if they would shake his hands off. And in the half-reticent methods of Tripp's Cove, every lord and lady bright that was in Moses Marvel's parlor there said, Honoured be the bravest knight, and beloved the fairest fair. And there was a bunch of laurel hanging in the middle of the room, as make-believe mistletoe, and the boys who could not make-believe even that they were eighteen, so that they had been left at home, would catch Phoebe and Sarah and Mattie and Helen when, by accident, they crossed underneath the laurel, and would kiss them for all their screaming. And soon Moses Marvel brought in a waiter with wedding cake, and Nathan Philbrick brought in a waiter with bride cake, and pretty Mattie Marvel brought in a waiter with currant wine. And Tom Cutts gave every girl a piece of wedding cake himself, and made her promise to sleep on it. And before they were all gone, he and Laura had been made to write names for the girls to dream upon, that they might draw their fortunes the next morning. And before long Moses Cutts led Mrs. Spaulding out into the great family room, and there was the real wedding supper. And after they had eaten the supper, Bengal's fiddle sounded in the parlor, and they danced, and they waltzed, and they polked to their heart's content. And so they celebrated the Christmas of 1861. Too bad, was it not? Tom's leave was only twenty days. It took five to come. It took five to go. After the wedding there were but seven little days. And then he kissed dear Laura good-bye, with tears running from his eyes and hers, and she begged him to be sure she would be all right, and he begged her to be certain nothing would happen to him. And so, for near two years, they did not see each other's faces again. Christmas Eve again! Moses Marvel has driven out his own bays in his own double cutter to meet the stage at Fordyce's. On the back seat is Mattie Marvel, with a rosy little baby all wrapped up in furs, who has never seen his father. Where is Laura? Here she comes! Here she comes! Sure enough, here is the stage at last. Job Stiles never swept round with a more knowing sweep or better satisfied with his precious freight at Fordyce's than he did this afternoon. And the curtains were up already, and there is Laura, and there is Tom. He is pale, poor fellow, but how pleased he is! Laura is out first, of course, and then she gives him her hand so gently, and the others all help. And here is the hero at Marvel's side and he is bending over his baby, whom he does not try to lift with his one arm. And Mattie is crying, and I believe old Moses Marvel is crying. But everybody is as happy as a king, and everybody is talking at one time, and all the combination has turned out well. 
Tom Cutts had had a hole made through his left thigh, so that they despaired of his life, and as he lay on the ground, a bit of a shell had struck his left forearm and knocked that to pieces. Tom Cutts had been sent back to hospital at Washington and reported by telegraph as mortally wounded. But almost as soon as Tom Cutts got to the Lincoln Hospital himself, Laura Cutts got there too, and then Tom did not mean to die if he could help it, and Laura did not mean to have him. And the honest fellow held to his purpose in that steadfast Cutts way. The blood tells, I believe, and love tells, and will tells. How much love has to do with will? I believe you are a witch, Mrs. Cutts, the doctor used to say to her. Nothing but good happens to this good man of yours. Bits of bone came out just as they were wanted to. Inflammation kept away just as it was told to do. And the two wounds ran a race with each other in healing after their fashion. It will be a beautiful stump after all, said the doctor, where poor Laura saw little beauty. But everything was beautiful to her when at last he told her that she might wrap her husband up as well as she knew how and take him home and nurse him there. So she had telegraphed that they were coming, and that was the way in which it happened that her father and her sister had brought out the baby to meet them both at Fordyce's. Mattie's surprise had worked perfectly. And now it was time for Laura's surprise. After she had her baby in her own arms and was on the back seat of the sleigh, after Tom was well wrapped up by her side, with his well arm just supporting the little fellow's head, and after Matty was all tucked in by her father, and Mr. Marvel himself had looked round to say, Already? Then was it that Jem Marvel first stepped out from the stage and said, Haven't you one word for me, Matty? Then how they screamed again, for everybody thought Jem was in the West Indies. He was cruising there on board the Grey Wing, looking after blockaders who took the southern route. Nobody dreamed of Jem's being at Christmas, and here he had stumbled on Tom and Laura in the New Haven train as they came on. Jem had been sent into New York with a prize. He had got leave and was on his way to see the rest of them. He had bidden Laura not say one word, and so he had watched one greeting from the stage before he broke in to take his part for another. Oh, what an uproarious Christmas that was when they all came home! No, Tom Cutts would not let one of them be sad. He was the cheeriest of them all. He monopolized the baby and showed immense power in the way of baby talk and of tending. Laura had only to sit on the side of the room and be perfectly happy. It was very soon known what the arrivals were. And Parson Spaulding came in, and his wife, and of course the Cutses had been there already. Then everybody came. That is the simplest way of putting it. They all would have wanted to come, because in that community there was not one person who did not love Laura and Tom and Jem. But whether they would have come on the very first night, I am not sure. But this was Christmas Eve, and the girls were finishing off the meeting-house just as the stage and the sleigh came in. And in a minute the news was everywhere, and of course everybody felt he might just go in to get news from the fleet or the army. Nor was there one household in Tripp's Cove which was not more or less closely represented in the fleet or the army. So there was really, as the evening passed, a town meeting in Moses Marvel's sitting-room and parlour, and whether Moses Marvel were most pleased, or Mrs. Marvel, or Laura, who sat and beamed, or old General Simeon Cutts, I am sure I do not know. That was indeed a merry Christmas. But after that I must own it was hard sledding for Tom Cutts and for pretty Laura, a hero with one blue sleeve pinned neatly together, who at the best limps as he walks, quickens all your compassion and gratitude, yes, 
but when you are selecting a director of your lumber works or when you are sending to new york to buy goods or when you are driving a line of railway through the wilderness i am afraid you do not choose that hero to do your work for you or if you do you were not standing by when tom cutts was looking right and looking left for something to do so that he might keep the wolf from the door it was sadly like the life that his great-grandfather samuel cutts led at the old farm in old newbury after the old war tom lost his place when he went to the front and he could not find it again laura sweet girl never complained no nor moses marvel he never complained nor would he complain if tom and his wife and children had lived with him till doomsday good luck for us said moses marvel and those were many words for him to say in one sentence but tom was proud and it ground him to the dust to be eating moses marvel's bread when he had not earned it and to have nothing but his major's pension to buy laura and the babies their clothes with and to keep the pot a-boiling of course jem joined the fleet again nor did jem return again till the war was over then he came and came with prize money he and tom had many talks of going into business together with tom's brains and jem's money but nothing came of this the land was no place for jem he was a regular norseman as are almost all of the trips cove boys who have come from the loins of the fighting twenty-seventh they sniff the tempest from afar off and when they hear of puget sound or of alaska or of wilkes antarctic continent they fancy that they hear a voice from some long-lost home from which they have strayed away and so laura knew and tom knew that any plans which rested on jem staying ashore were plans which had one false element in them the raven would be calling him and it might be best once for all to let him follow the raven till the raven called no more so jem put his prize money into a new bark which he found building at bath and they called the bark the laura and tom and laura cutts went to the launching and jem superintended the rigging of her himself and then he took tom and laura and the babies with him to new york and a high time they had together there tom saw many of the old army boys and laura hunted up one or two old school friends and they saw a booth in iago and screamed themselves hoarse at niblo's and heard rudolfsen and johansen in the german opera they rode in the park and they walked in the park they browsed in the aster and went shopping at stewart's and saw the people paint porcelain at hayward's and by mr alden's kindness went through the wonders of harper's in short for three weeks all of which time they lived on board ship they saw the lions of new york as children of the public do for whom that great city decks itself and prepares its wonders albeit their existence is hardly known to its inhabitants meanwhile jem had chartered the laura for a voyage to san francisco and so before long her cargo began to come on board and she and tom and the babies took a mournful farewell and came back to tripp's cove again to moses marvel's house and poor tom thought it looked smaller than ever and that he should find it harder than ever to settle down to being of no use to anybody and to eat moses marvel's bread without house or barn or bin or oven or board or bed even the meanest of his own poor tom and this was the reward of being the first man in maine to enter for three years and then things went worse and worse moses marvel was as good and as taciturn as ever but moses marvel's affairs did not run as smoothly as he liked moses held on upon one year's cutting of lumber perfectly determined that lumber should rise because it ought to and moses paid very high usury on the money he borrowed because he would hold on moses was set in his way like other persons whom you and i know 
and to this lumber he held and held till finally the bank would not renew his notes. No, and they would not discount a cent for him at Bangor, and Moses came back from a long taciturn journey he had started on in search of money without any money, and with only the certainty that if he did not mean to have the sheriff sell his lumber, he must sell it for himself. Nay, he must sell it before the fourth of the next month, and for cash, and must sell at the very bottom of a long falling market. Poor Moses Marvel, that operation served to show that he joined all the cut's want of luck with the Marvel obstinacy. It was a wretched twelve month, the whole of it, and it made that household, and made Tom Cutts, more miserable and more. Then they became anxious about the Laura and Jem. She made almost a clipper voyage to California. She discharged her cargo in perfect order. Jem made a capital charter for Australia and England, and knew that from England it would be easy to get a voyage home. He sailed from California, and then the letter stopped. No, Laura dear, no need in reading every word of the ship news in the semi-weekly advertiser. The name of your namesake is not there. Eight, nine, ten months have gone by, and there is no port in Christendom which has seen Jem's face or the Laura's private signal. Do not strain your eyes over the semi-weekly more. No, dear Laura's eyes will be dimmed by other cares than the ship news. Tom's father, who had shared Tom's wretchedness, and would gladly have had them in his home, but that Moses Marvel's was the larger and the less peopled of the two, Tom's father was brought home speechless one day by the men who found him where he had fallen on the road, his yoke of oxen not far away, waiting for the voice which they were never to hear again. Whether he had fallen from the cart, in some lurch it made, and broken his spine, or whether all this distress had brought on of a sudden a stroke of paralysis, so that he lost his consciousness before he fell, I do not know nor do I see that it matters much, though the chimney-corners of Tripp's Cove discuss the question quite eagerly to this hour. He lay there month after month, really unconscious. He smiled gently when they brought him food. He tried to say thank you, they thought, but he did not speak to the wife of his bosom, who had been the Laura Marvel of her day, in any different way from that in which he tried to speak to any stranger of them all. A living death he lay in as those tedious months went by. Yet my dear Laura was as cheerful and hopeful and buoyant as ever. Tom Cutts himself was ashamed to brood when he got a sight of her. Mother Cutts herself would lie down and rest herself when Laura came round with the two children, as she did every afternoon. Moses Marvel himself was less taciturn when Laura put the boys, one at one side, one at the other, of his chair, at the tea-table. And in both of those broken households, from one end to the other, they knew the magic of dear Laura's spells. So that when this Christmas came, after poor Mr. Cutts had been lying senseless so long, when dear Laura bade them all take hold and fit up a Christmas tree with all the adornments for the little boys, and for the Spalding children, and the Marvel cousins, and the Hopkinses, and the Treadgolds, and the Newmarch children, they all obeyed her loyally and without wondering. They obeyed her with her own determination that they would have one merry Christmas more. It seems a strange thing to people who grew up outside of New England, but this was the first Christmas tree ever seen at Tripp's Cove, for all such festivities are of recent importation in such regions. But there was something for every child. They heaped on more wood, and they kept a merry Christmas despite the storm without. This was Laura's will, and Laura had her way. And she had her reward. Job Stiles came round to the door, when he had put up his horse, and called Tom out and gave him a letter which he had brought from Ellsworth, and Tom read the letter, and he called Laura to read it, 
and Laura left the children and sat at the kitchen table with him and read it and said, Thank God! This is a Christmas present indeed. Could anything in this world be better? This is the letter. John Wildair to Tom Cutts. Dear Tom, I am just back from Washington. I have seen them all, and have done my best, and have failed. They say, and I believe, that the collectorship was promised to Waters before the old man's death, that Waters had honest claims, he has but one leg, you know, and that it must go to him. As for the surveyorship, the gift of that is with Plumpter, and you know that I might as well ask the Pope to give me anything as he, and if he hates anybody more than me, why, it is your wife's father. So I could do nothing there. Let me say this, though, it seems nothing. If, while we are waiting to look around, you like to take the Bell and Hammer Lighthouse, you may have the place to-morrow. Of course, I know it is exile in winter, but in summer it is lovely. You have your house, your stores, two men under you, they are double lights, and a thousand dollars. I have made them promise to give it to no one till they hear from me. Though I know you ought not take any such place, I would not refuse it till I let you know. I send this to Ellsworth for the stage driver to take, and you must send your answer by special messenger that I may telegraph to Washington at once. I am very sorry, dear Tom, to have failed you so, but I did my best, you know. Merry Christmas to Laura and the babies. Truly yours, John Wildair, Portland, December 24, 1868. That was Laura and Tom's Christmas present, an appointment as lighthouse keeper with a thousand a year. End of Story 1, Chapter 2, Part 1